Time for Aussies and Kiwis to unite against bail-in deposit theft. And shut down Aspie, think tank of lies and war. Coming up in this week's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 28th of January 2022. I'm Robert Barwick and today I'm joined by Citizens Party organiser Glenn Isherwood. Welcome Glenn. Thanks Robbie. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, happy to. I've dragged Glenn back on because Glenn's the reason this show exists. It was this guy who had the bold, bold idea, was it 12 years ago? Oh Robbie, we should do a YouTube show. Mm. And that's the, <laughs> that's now the Citizens Report. Yeah. And so I you cop can, it all the time from him. He's my pr- complains all the time. Glenn's usually the producer or one of the producers of the show. Um, he can now share the burden in front of the camera. So all right. Thanks. Thanks for joining, Glenn. Um, so yeah, this today on the show we're going to discuss bail-in again. There's been a development in New Zealand people need to know about uh, and what it means for New Zealand and Australia. And there is an organisation in Canberra which is just belches out lies and it's one of the principal organisations that's brought the world to the brink of war and we're going to expose it and we have to shut it down. If you, um, uh, you can help share, get the show around by liking it, clicking the like button, uh, make sure you do share it around, send it to people. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe and ring the bell icon and any references we make in the show you can find in the information below. Uh, before we begin, though, Glenn, just you know, we opened the year talking about the Russia crisis mm-hmm. um, a couple yep. of weeks ago. So, just a quick update: the main game in that crisis is the dialogue between uh, Russia and the United States. Where just before Christmas, the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister gave his American counterpart um, two draft treaties, which basically enshrine Russia's demands for its security. And the the essence is: you told us, Russia says to America, you told us 30 years ago. NATO would not expand up to our borders, now it has, and you're trying to lure Ukraine into NATO and we will not have it. This for us is the equivalent of JFK staring down the Soviets over the Cuban Missile Crisis and ordering those missiles out of there. So it's the same thing, Um, this is our demand for security. Uh, So this week, the Americans have replied to that. They are, they've, they've, uh, in their reply, we don't know a lot about it yet, but um, that's what you, where I'm, why I'm mentioning this, Glenn, because people need to, when you look at the news, look out for this, this right. news. In their reply, they said, well, we'll talk about some things, but we won't talk about that. Now, that means the whole thing's unresolved, right? And people need to, um, you know, just be aware of that. This crisis is only going to get worse before it gets better. Just to reiterate, reiterate Robbie, um, on the show previous weeks, you mentioned Malcolm Fraser and his book, Dangerous Allies. Uh, a lot of very senior statesmen have warned that this expansion of NATO eastward up to Russia's border is a major red flag for them. Yep. And they're not they're not just going to be passive and sit back and say ho hum about that because there's a you know the nuclear strategic balance that's existed since the cold war these countries having missile systems closer to russia is um it it's upsets the entire world strategic balance and they that's how they've said it way back uh, going back to george bush uh, hw bush if we don't want the world to go to the brink of nuclear war we must see it through Russians' eyes. We may not agree with everything, but we have to be able to see that perspective. And senior statesmen could. The current crop that's in charge of Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom Mm. seem incapable of it. They're the ones driving the war danger. All right, let's move on to the main show though, Glenn. Yep. Time for Aussies and Kiwis to unite against the bail-in theft of deposits. And this is something that is uh, our party, the Citizens Party, is uniquely qualified to talk about because we're the party that's been exposing bail-in in Australia um, uh, for the last almost 10 years. Um, here's the context that wh- why this is, has an urgency now. Everyone's hearing about inflation. What inflation does, it puts upward pressure on interest rates. And if you look at the debt structure it's hanging over the world, including countries like Australia, that spells a disaster. It spells a disaster for the borrowers. It spells a disaster for the lenders, right? And especially mortgage holders. You know, there's 43% of Australians by the last count 
or mortgage stress is probably more now. And they cannot handle interest rate rises, but that's what, how central banks respond to. And all, all of the big four banks in Australia, 60% of their loan book portfolio yeah. is re uh, mortgages. Yeah. So uh, whereas 30, 40 years ago, the concentration of mortgages was about 25% of their loan book, now uh, it, and uh, the rest was industry business, it's completely flipped. And so if there's a massive, if the, if the borrowers collapse under the debt burden caused by rising interest rates, mm. it's the banks. Because of that overexposure, it's the banks that are in trouble. And people who understand bail-in know that that's a problem because mm. bail-in was invented, was devised for when banks got into trouble, right? And um, uh, as a way to keep the banks propped up, by stealing, literally stealing out of the accounts the money of their depositors. Mm. So we're at one of those acute danger points right now. Um, what's just happened is in New Zealand, there's been an interesting development. Back in April last year, the New Zealand government announced it was going to enact a statutory bail-in law. Now, statutory bail-in is a... The IMF has put out the call for all countries to enact a statutory bail-in law. Statutory bail-in, though, just means that you have a bail-in law that's in legislation and it's all detailed what you can do and what you can't do, mm. right? And it has to be passed through parliaments. And when you have a process like that, you can draw attention to this issue. And suddenly, you can have the public hear about a bill that's where they're actually talking about, hang on, they can take my deposits. And then they go to the Member of Parliament and go, are you going to pass a bill... That means you can take my deposits to save a bank and that member of parliament will go, mm, help, <laughs> right? And um, yeah. it can go pear-shaped. So New Zealand didn't take long for them to figure that out. Last October, and we, we're only reporting this now because of the acute danger, but also um, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, had to find the details sort of slightly belatedly over the Christmas period, etc. But, Glenn, last October, the New Zealand government dropped this idea. We are not going to have a statutory bail-in law because it was attached to another bill. It was going to be part of a, a big bill they want to pass called the Deposit Takers Act, which is a great big overhaul of the banking system regulation. They're going to introduce, supposedly, um, a, a, a deposit guarantee for the first time. They've never had one. It's quite extraordinary that they would announce that they're dropping it, Robbie, because the IMF... The Financial Stability Board yep. of the Bank for International Settlements is adamant that all nations must have a statutory bail-in. And for them to drop it like this is a confirmation, affirmation of our campaign working uh, yes. across the pond, across the water. Um, uh, we've raised the awareness uh, about the threat and danger of bail-in going right back to when it was first used in Cyprus in 2013. And, and one of our examples, well, I want to talk about Cyprus more in a minute, but one of our mm -hmm. examples that we've told Australians about with bail-in is New Zealand because despite dropping this law, this statutory law, they already have bail-in powers in New Zealand and they're extraordinary. Mm. It's called Open mm. Bank Resolution, but it's a directions power of the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank could just devise it as a rule and say, okay, this is how we're going to handle bank crises. And they did it before the Financial Stability Board did it. They did it in the mid-2000s. And they come up with this thing called Open Bank Resolution. They said, oh, if a bank fails, we're going, to, we're going to take some of your money to keep it up and they said, and that'll be good for you. This is We're doing this in depositors' interest because you either lose some money to prop the bank up or you lose all your money when the bank goes under, mm. right? That, that's, that was the ultimatum. It's, it's, it's like we're making a declaration we have the power to do this, almost like well, well, yeah. it is a banker's dictatorship. Yeah, Bail-in is. is a banker's dictatorship under the OBR. And I remember back then APRA asserted, and some experts have asserted, APRA claim they have the same power already. But that doesn't wash with democracy, and, and hence they have to get it through Parliament. Well, but it's, and actually, that is why not everyone in the IMF is the devil. Um, you may not believe that. Most of them are. <laughs> no, it's just that that is, there are people I'll in the IMF. I'll settle on most. <laughs> there are people in the IMF <laughs> who have, who looked at that, that kind of way and thought, look, this is too, um, this is too fluffy. Will it be used? Won't it be used? That's why we need statutory bail-in, where it's written in law, exactly what triggers it, exactly what the protections are, mm. etc. Mm. Right? And um, this is where this is where New Zealand's run into trouble and has had to backtrack. Now, um, 
this is an opportunity to get rid of the existing one, but I just want to make the point, when New Zealand set up Open Bank Resolution, nobody in New Zealand knew about it. Since the Financial Stability Board put out its call direction that all countries should adopt bail-in, um, all the countries that have, have done it secretly. Right? The United States actually was the first country to yes. adopt bail-in, and how did it do it? Well, it actually was uh, legislated through the Dodd-Frank Act, the famous huge mega bill that came in. 700 um, page bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, after the global financial crash. That now, was 2010. Yeah, Dodd-Frank Act actually required about 30,000 pages of law changes. Yes. <laughs> and there was congressmen, congresswomen all across the uh, Washington DC who were shocked when, you know, associates and collaborators of ours went to their office and presented the proof of bail-in, they didn't even know they passed it. And, and that happened in 2013 after Cyprus. It wasn't mm. until the Cyprus bail-in of 2013 where, mm. for those who can remember, we're being, you know, the world was on edge. What's happening to these two Cyprus banks? Because the people of Cyprus are being told, you're going to lose your money to keep these banks propped up. Then everyone started looking and going, oh, oh my God, there's this thing called bail-in and it's being secretly enacted mm. around the world. And that was one. Uh, yeah. In the United States, sorry, that's in the U United Kingdom and the European Union, when the, Euro when, when the UK was still in the EU, they passed this very large um, bail-in law. Yeah, that, that was the Bank uh, Resolution Recovery Directive, directive. Uh, telling, though, that the UK brought it in a full 12 months before the EU did. Yes. And that's not a surprise because one of the key chief architects of bail-in globally is Mark Carney, the head of the Bank of England, who was at the Financial Stability Board before that. At the time, he was yeah. the head of the Bank of England, yeah. yeah and, um, you know, Mark Carney is, uh, as far as central bankers go, one of, you could say he's part of that international banking cartel that oversee all of these uh, laws being rolled out around the world. Well, I'll just point out, as you mm. said, he had been the head of the Financial Stability Board before yep. being in the Bank of England. Um, his ex Goldman Sachs, mm. the head of the Financial Stability Board at the time of the development of bail in, is now the Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi, his ex Goldman Sachs, and what it was actually investment bankers that banded together and, and uh, you know, ex investment bankers in these institutions that made sure this happened, right? Mm. Um, uh, it's, it's important to maybe at this point say why bail in was developed, Robbie, because because uh, well, there was an alternative, wasn't there? Well, yes. Um, so bail-in was developed as the ostensible you know, way to solve future global financial crises. They said, oh my God, look at this contagion. One bank fell over, in this case, Lehman Brothers, and they didn't anticipate the dominoes of banks falling all over the world because of these things called financial derivatives, which now we estimate have, there's over $2,000 trillion uh, uh, dollars worth of these financial product which most regulators, most politicians don't even understand. But when they go bad, they can go really bad and blow Absolutely. the entire world economy to hell. So these clever Wall Street bankers and you know Bank of England, uh, IMF, BIS, they came up with the idea, what if we could stop the dominoes falling by saving the bank before it collapsed? What if we used the customer's money? What if we used mum's and dad's money let, let, let them take a haircut, make them unwilling shareholders to lose their deposits, turn those deposits into shares in a bank, they become a de facto owner of a failing bank and the bank stays afloat for some time, no problem. No crisis. Yeah, no crisis. And they had a sanctimonious uh, justification because mm. they said this is an alternative to taxpayer bailouts. See, the taxpayer yeah. won't have to pay anymore, the customers will. That's false. There was a much better alternative though, Glenn. Mm, yeah. Look, the, the real way to, to solve this problem is don't bail out derivatives, period. Let them fail, you know, eat your losses, go home and cry in a corner somewhere because governments should not bail out um, too big to fail banks. Too big to fail banks should not exist. But if a bank, if a bank is... Uh, failing and it's got a lot of customers' deposits, yeah. how do you solve that problem? You split the commercial and saving side of banking off the investment and speculative side of banking. So uh, the everyday banking that you and I use and businesses use, the savings bank side is completely separate structurally yeah. from the other side of banking. And the, and the law that does that is Glass-Steagall. That's uh, existed 
in the last century for over 60, for 66 years, but was repealed just before the global financial crash. Um, we've led the fight to bring it back here, and that's one of our you know, top priorities for all of our political campaigns. So what happened was after Cyprus, we've mm. been, we'd been fighting for Glass-Steagall in Australia since 2008 event, uh, 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 effectively, mm -hmm. after the global financial crash. Um, after Cyprus, this took on a, a new urgency because suddenly we saw what the banker's alternative to Glass-Steagall was, this thing called bail-in. Um, we also detected in Australia, the Financial Stability Board said Australia is planning bail-in legislation and you, you're even the person from our office who a Treasury official acknowledged to you, yeah, a bill is in the works, mm -hmm. right? And we put out the call about that in 2013 saying, look, they're planning bail-in. Um, uh, we took this uh, document that Glenn did up. Mm, this one? Glenn produced, this is one of the, uh, the best uh, Citizens Party brochures we've ever produced, Glass-Steagall Now. Um, what was that, December 2014 or 2013? I can't remember now. This we've, was uh, we've December 2013 and uh, the first edition came out January 2014. You and I, you and I went to you, um, Canberra for the last sitting of Parliament in December 2013 with that document going and meeting members of parliament saying, you be aware of this danger. One of the senators we met was um, the famous Wacker Williams, who was the National Party senator that did the most to get the Banking Royal Commission up. He was the head of the Economics Committee, and we were telling him about the danger of bail-in and the danger of, of derivatives for the banks. And what was his question to us? Well, he asked us to explain again to him in simple terms what derivatives were. The head of the Economics Committee in the Australian Parliament wanted us to tell him what derivatives were. But uh, credit to Wacker Williams, I mean, he had the honesty to ask because uh, right. we discovered, we <laughs> found out um, that uh, uh, APRA tried to define derivatives for 12 months and the, after 12 months of trying to work out what these things were, they gave up they gave and walked up. away. No, that's, exa that's uh, exactly right. Anyway, yep. <laughs> so here's the thing though. Um, uh, Bail-in, where it's passed around the world, has been done effectively secretly. It's been done, it's like buried in big bills, uh, bur buried in technical jargon so that only the technocrats participate in the discussion, nobody else knows what's going on, the media hardly pays any attention. That was the case for the EU and UK and Canada, frankly. And of course, New Zealand, they just did it, the Reserve Bank just decided, oh, we're going to have this rule, right? The mm -hmm. public mm -hmm. don't know. Where the public have known in advance, where there's been a debate in advance, it's been impossible. So in 2017, we were, we, were, we were tipped off in 2013 that Australia planned legislation. In 2017, um, both mm. Australia and India put up bail-in legislation. Now, in the case of India, their government announced, okay, this is our bill, mm. we're gonna, we're gonna to, to be able to bail in uh, you know, what they call them, um, unsecured creditors, mm -hmm. a euphemism for depositors, etc., bondholders. Uh, the Indians public heard about this bill and they went off their heads. The backlash was enormous. And in fact, one of the reasons probably why it was enormous, uh, yeah. Glenn, we've talked about this on the show before, a year earlier, the Indian government had done this incredibly stupid um, and, and um, far-reaching uh, cash uh, reform, right? They just scrapped a whole heap of cash and threw the news, the Indian mm. economy into chaos. I was, was going to mention that, um, Robbie. The fact is that when you're looking at bail-in, it's also synonymous with measures and efforts mm. to restrict the use of cash, yep. cash ban laws, and they've been brought into Europe, you know, some countries down to limiting cash uh, transactions to a thousand euros. Uh, that happened to India, and then uh, straight after that, they're finding out bail-ins on the agenda, and yeah, yeah. It went so when down. the Indian, like the yeah. Indians saw yeah. the chaos the cash thing had caused, mm. and then when they heard the government was going to come up with bail-in, they said no way, and the Indian government was forced to drop it. So what happened here? Well, because there'd been much longer fight over bail-in because of us, because we had been screaming about it since 2013. Scott Morrison was the treasurer, and he had this bill. Um, Financial sector legislation reform, crisis resolution powers and other measures bill 2017. It's right? so hard to say that even we get it wrong. <laughs> vaguely, <laughs> a vaguely titled bill. And it was released, uh, the, what's called the exposure draft was released in, uh, on, on a, late on a Friday afternoon in August in 2017 when nobody's watching. That's why they released them mm. there. 
Well, one person was watching. He happened to be in our office, Doug Mitchell, and was aware. You know, he saw something in the wording that made him think, what's this? He sends it to me. Robbie, is this bail-in? And we're all over it straight away. Yeah. And we started a big debate. I remember that so, at the same time I said, oh, geez, if they only changed the name to Bank Resolution Recovery Directive, it would be the bail-in law. That's right. That no, was my right. comment to, uh, to um, Doug's initial observation. And so it was, we were off to the races. This is the one we warned about. And, um, you know, from that, that point on, I mean, still to this day, there's a lot of Australians out there in denial or can't believe a law like this exists, but we're coming up on the fourth anniversary of its passing. And the, how they passed it, um, collusion between Labor and Liberal yep. uh, uh, governments, uh, the opposition, Chris Bowen specifically. Um, and then uh, when they came to the final vote, there was only eight people present in the chamber when they did their final vote on the voices they didn't call for a quorum. There was, uh, they orchestrated it such that the One Nation senators who wanted to amend the bill to include, uh, to take the ambiguity out of the, the wording to ensure deposits were safe and, and off limits, they, they, they organised the vote to happen when One Nation wasn't there and One Nation wasn't aware the vote happened. Yep. And that was uh, Matthias Cormann, uh, obviously with you know, the full knowledge who, who of Scott total, Morrison. Who was well. a total tool of the banks. Yeah. Um, Senator and Jane, Scott Morrison was treasurer at the time, so uh, let's not forget that. The, 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 you know, the, the, the Morrison government, and every, Morrison's whole career has been a stooge of the banks. Senator Jane Hume, who chaired the inquiry, we call him yeah. the Senator for Bankers, etc. The reason, the reason One Nation wanted to have that amendment is because this bill is a bail-in law, but it's not a statutory bail-in law like the IMF requires. It, it lays out all the details clearly. This was something we identified had a loophole in it, a back door. And the, and, and the, the alarming thing about that, the reason we had to jump at it is because the powers of the regulated Glen are actually quite awesome. And in a financial crisis, if they're not forbidden expressly from doing something, if they're not expressly for, then they yeah. can do anything. Yeah. Anything that they're not forbidden from doing, they can do. Um, and this gave them enough scope. We know the push for, around the world was for bailing and deposits. This gave them enough scope. And um, that, that's why they had to sneak it through. So now we've just seen in New Zealand the same, like the, the same reality that governments don't want to engage the public on this. They want to follow the dictates of the international banking masters in, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. right? And the world's central banks. And uh, they want to follow those dictates. But they have a problem when it comes to being honest about that with the public. And, and so Jacinda Ardern has just fled, fled away from a debate. Well, that's where we need to take stock of this because what it shows you is they're scared of us, the public, right? And we can seize this opportunity. The Kiwis, Kiwi viewers of this show, get on your um, horses, right? Round up the posse. Uh, if they are running away from statutory bail-in, demand they drop open bank resolution as well. Get rid of it. It shouldn't be there. We have to force them to go down the Glass-Steagall option instead. That's what they should be doing, protecting people by stopping banks from being gambling casinos. That's what Glass-Steagall is. Mm. Don't have a bail-in which says continue to gamble. We'll, ha we'll, we'll let you use your, your customers as your backstop. We've got to get back to a world and an economy where the consequence of stupidity is failure. And these big, two big devailed banks have enjoyed the protection racket of governments and central banks for too long. Glass-Steagall ensures that banking is, you know, is, is responsible and boring and it's vectored yep. towards uh, the real economy. Investment, you know, returns should be made from effort, ingenuity, creativity of your workforce. Banks are there to facilitate that kind of growth, but if they're chasing, you know, mega profits through gambling and speculation, they deserve to fail, um, and uh, and we shouldn't have the. But the public shouldn't pay yeah, for that. We shouldn't be in that system. We should be completely cut away from it. So that's what Glass Steagall does. We have a bill to pass that. So the New Zealands have, yeah, they have an option: get rid of open bank resolution for Australians. Senator Malcolm Roberts of One Nation got that amendment, dusted it off in 2020 and put it up as a bill, right? And um, instead of passing it, the government got scared that one of their side was going to cross the floor and they said, okay, we'll negotiate a resolution here. But Josh Frydenberg has done, actually, he's just dragged his feet. There's been a few discussions behind the scenes, mm -hmm. I can report that, but they just done, dragged their feet. So, so we're now in, in a pre-election period. 
politicians are more vulnerable than ever. You tell them, pass Malcolm Roberts' bill. The Liberal Party, the Labor Party must commit to pass Malcolm Roberts' bill. It doesn't cost anybody anything. John Hewson famously in 2020 called it a no-brainer to pass it, the, the former Liberal opposition leader. Um, it takes the issue of bail-in off the table. Mm. And then we get to put up real um, mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, and there's a, we want to make a quick contrast here because if you've ever want to be motivated to deal with a financial problem before it arises, you better help us get rid of bail-in because if everything does go wrong and you do lose your money in the bank and you want to complain to someone, don't bother to complaining to the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which has been set up for bank complaints because they're not going to help you, are they, Glenn? Yes, uh, Robbie, um, AFCA... Uh, is a hopeless, not fit for purpose uh, entity. We're going to cover this more in future shows, but uh, we are. Um, you and I have worked uh, extensively in the last six months with the victims of Sterling First, um, and uh, AFCA is supposed to be there to be the, um, the umpire of complaints. The, the umpire and, and, and resolve complaints between financial institutions and, cu and consumers, cons customers. And in almost every case, they side with the banks. It is rigged entirely. And, in and uh, banks. they won't. Uh, and it's it's basically there as n a non-entity. In in and we'll get into it next time. But yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't have institutions that can um, you know uh, back you when you have to take these banks on. And the cost of going through the courts and litigation is so prohibitive. Most people never get there. Oh, exactly. Um, so yeah. Well, so. Uh, we will cover this in a, uh, a future show, um, but there is a three-page article in this week's issue of the Australian Alert Service by Melissa Harrison on AFCA. It's, it's quite shocking, really. Um, feel free to call in and get a copy of the Alert Service to be able to uh, read that article. It's also available on our website, as is a press release we've put out today on this bail-in question, right? So you can click on that, go to our website, look at the press release on this bail-in question and click on the links and um, update yourself that way. All right, well, I think we've done justice to that subject, uh, Glenn, as, as much as we can mm -hmm. in, in a show like this. Yep. Let's move on now. Shut down ASPE, think tank of lies and war. And what we're talking about, is ASPE is the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And if you take the I out, ASP is a snake. A forked tongue snake mm, is an good. ASP, good right? Point. And that is what we have in Canberra it's belching out lies, and it's done so for years, belching out lies to deliberately, consciously, intentionally start wars. That's what it does. That's what it is, is, exists for. And that's what the, uh, the world's biggest weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin, who sponsor it, profit from. I'll just point out two things for the audience to be aware. ASPE is on the government's uh, list of foreign influence transparency, transparency scheme public register. The, anyway, that's basically a, a, an organisation that is receiving foreign funding for foreign and domestic political purposes. To promote other, to, to promote foreign entities. Yes, yeah, so, so where does that money come from? We know it comes from NATO grants, uh, from US military uh, uh, private military companies like Lockheed Martin and uh, the Fairies others. And all yep, those. yep. Um, and from the US uh, uh, Defence Department. State Department. State the biggest, Department. The biggest funder, this, of all its foreign funders, the biggest is the US State Department. Then mm. the other ones you said, the UK government and the Dutch government and the Japanese government are in there as well. Yet yeah, they the, roll them out on ABC all the time as being you know, an independent oh, yeah, yeah. Thought, uh, source of information. Uh, but they don't tell you any of that, do they? But the majority of the funding is actually from the Australian Defence Department. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's why, if we're paying for it, we shouldn't tolerate it. Um, right now, it's like this week, this last week or so, it's been on the news all the time, you know, spruiking the, the need to um, go to war against Russia as usual. Um, However, its main thing uh, is China. This org it's stunning, for those of us who have been combating the China disinformation, it is stunning how almost all the anti-China reporting in the world, and it's just been a massive drumbeat yesterday, and, it, and it's, it's, it's big claims of you know, genocide and organ harvesting and threat to the world and about to invade Taiwan and all that kind of stuff, and it's little nagging claims. Nothing the Chinese can do is right. The last, yesterday, guess what I saw? 
a Sky News UK report being played in Australia about how China is bad because it's using artificial snow in Beijing for the Olympics. Right? And that's bad. You know, why? I don't know. So they're using snow machines. They're using Robbie. snow machines, Glenn. Um, oh. You know, it, it's less green. For, who, who knows? It's just like there, there's nothing that the Chinese can do that the, the media narrative machine will not snipe at. Um, Actually, I think, I, I think they used them at Sochi in Russia as well. And they used them in Vancouver in Canada in 2010 mm. because it was a warm winter, mm. right? And they had a big snow. They, like every damn result, um, resort uses them. Get, you know, anyway, it's, it's that sort of thing. It's just constant stuff. Um, but a lot of the big stuff is always uh, sourced to ASPE. ASPE of the, you know, some, the, some German media report will say the Australian Strategic Policy Institute says, and if you're in Germany or Canada or the United States or, you know, Chile, and, and you're reading, oh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, boy, that sounds official, right? Um, but that, that sounds credible, right? Um, and they have just been able to pump out all this stuff. When they first came to our attention, I, they, they, I remember when they really got on our radar, they, we knew about them before that, but when they really got on our radar, Glenn, was in 2016, because the census was the first online census. Remember, mm -hmm. it failed. The census failed. The Why did crashed, it fail? Yeah. Because they didn't have the, the enough um, uh, bandwidth and technology ready, and someone forgot to turn on a, a, a modem or something. So it was a total internal technical stuff up. Was it relying on Australia's privatised telecommunication <laughs> system, Rob? Um, that and IBM and whatever. Okay. Uh, you know, what did ASPE do? ASPE straight away comes out, China hacked the census. And that became the narrative. And a lot of people in Australia still think in 2016 China hacked the census. Because they didn't, had nothing to do with it. Every cyber attack, oh, China did it, China did it, China did it. Um, and in fact, they're so, you know, the, there, there is a faction in Australia, the United States, United Kingdom that's so determined to have conflict with China. When it comes to cyber attacks, we should assume they're doing it to themselves, right? I, I tell you, you, you know, if, if um, there's as much evidence for me saying we're, that, that our agencies are cyber attacking themselves just to blame China as there is for every ASPE claim against China, let me assure you, we're the ones that examine them. So we've been at them for a while. Um, it, this think tank, it, it's stunning how much this one think tank has made the world a more dangerous place. But what's the reason we're talking about it today is that there's a new report, and it's um, amazing. It's, it's a courageous lawyer, Australian lawyer. Her name's Jacqueline James. Um, she has a, a, a body she set up called Countering Western uh, Propaganda. She's actually has uh, she's an Australian lawyer, but she has experience um, in China, etc. She has put out a report exposing a a 2020 report by ASPE called Uyghurs for Sale, which is the report that created this whole narrative about Uyghur forced labour. So the Uyghurs are the Muslims in the, the far western autonomous region called um, Xinjiang, and they're the ones that are being genocided, even though their population's rising, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no mass graves, there's no mass, there's no mass refugees or anything like that, um, mass escapes from China. It's all rubbish, it's all lies. Um, uh, you know, whatever's happening there, the last thing is genocide. In fact, their living standards are rising, etc. But they stopped, they, most of the mainstream stopped banging on about genocide around 2020 and started jumping on forced labour, forced labour. And so they beat this, and, and, and forced labour is like one of those impossible things that if you're a Western corporation who has supply chains that go into China and you use cotton because Xinjiang is the biggest cotton producer in the world, right? Um, you are susceptible to this accusation. So under the, under the moralistic threats of forced labour, you know, you know, you, are you using forced labour? A lot of countries started divesting themselves of anything to do with Uyghur labour. And the greatest, um, one of the things that Jack James in her report points out is a consequence of these claims of forced labour using Uyghur populations is that uh, a lot of these global companies have stopped uh, employing them. So in effect, ASPE's report and these, uh, you know, these, this network of disinformation has actually disadvantaged Uyghurs in that part of China. And it's deliberate and strategic because China's program towards the Uyghurs in Xinjiang was a poverty alleviation program. It was to give them retraining, is a better word than re-education, the equivalent of TAFE courses, to get skills where they could go and be employable 
and le- earn money and raise their living standard. That's what has been succeeding in China. And because of this report and all the hullabaloo about it and the hysteria, a lot of those Uyghurs are now back to where they started from, right? And mm-hmm. China's, China's not going to abandon them, but um, this is deliberate and it, they attacked a vulnerability. Mm-hmm. So Jack took a very um, close look at this report from a legal standpoint, right? Now, I want Glenn to go through some of the specific proofs of lies in a minute, but I just want to, I'm going to read you just so that it does justice. I was going to read you um, uh, Jack's, Jacqueline James's methodology, okay? She said this, quote, I settled upon selecting ASPE's six case studies and filtering them through three separate sections. One, a legal analysis section where I let all of ASPE's allegations slip through to the next section, despite the fact that the central legal element of consent to work was missing from ASPE's discussion and what... Just to explain that, forced labour is defined under international labour organisation rules, right? And what she's saying there is they didn't, there's no even, none of their allegations even met that definition. Uh, Two, a merit analysis section where only some of ASPE's allegations were determined to be substantial enough to move on to the next section. So merit is, will this hold up in court? Right? Like, is there, is, is there merit to this claim that should go to court? That sort of idea, right? Just on that point about the UN having strict criteria for forced labour, what the ASPE report does is it conflates uh, conditions of substandard, you know, work conditions, poor conditions of work, you know, labour rights violations by companies. They've just lumped all that in as uh, under this umbrella of forced labour, and that's, they're completely yeah. different things. Uh, but that's to increase this, you know, pers- per- this perception Pat, it out, um, that there's, you know, this is systemic and rampant, you know, yeah. uh, when it's not. And then the third thing that Jack continues, an evidentiary analysis section where ASPE's substantial allegations were compared against its supporting evidence. In the first version of my paper, only seven of ASPE's 18 allegations were deemed substantial enough to move from the merit analysis section to the evidentiary analysis section where I found all seven allegations lacking a sound evidentiary basis. But then she produced this first edition. She was attacked by one of the authors of the report from Aspie. And so she went back and said, OK, here is the, all of it. This is what I've found. And what she found, um, which we've covered in this week's alert service, is none of it's true. Yep. So um, I can run through these, uh, Robbie, and we can uh, review yeah. them. Um, so... Second version of Jack James' paper, uh, the first uh, finding, Aspie had claimed halal signs in a restaurant across the road from the Taekwong Shoes Factory, where Uyghurs dined, had crossed out its halal signs. Yet the photograph presented as evidence clearly showed signage uh, in Chinese with the words, this is a halal restaurant, (laughs) Uh, which Jack James can read because she, she can speak Mandarin. Moreover, the restaurant was not across the road from the factory um, as claimed, but in town, thereby having no connection to the shoe factory. And that's very important because this, by singling out that shoe factory, that's a supplier to Western shoe companies, mm. right? And she, you know, the, the ASPE report wanted Western shoe companies to think, oh, our supplier mistreats Uyghurs because they're Muslims, even though they're one example of that, or th- this particular example was about a restaurant that had nothing to do with the factory, even if it was true, but it wasn't true because it says this is a halal restaurant. Next one. Um, Aspie had claimed the Taekwong Shoe Factory had a watchtower, but the photographic evidence of the watchtower was so pathetically small that it was comical when placed alongside photographs of actual watchtowers. Yes. Um, I want to give a... Uh, let me just give another one here. Like we won't go through them all because we are running out of time. But I just yeah. there's another thing that uh, it, it's a bit more sensitive. But she points out an example where Aspie cherry picks st- it, Aspie mm-hmm. sources. When you read Aspie sources and it says, "Oh, this is the source for the evidence of this claim we're making," you can see that evidence and you, you see that they've twisted it. But then you see other people in those other things in that in that particular source that Aspie ignores. It cherry picks it because it doesn't. Um, and she gives the example of them excluding a tragic story of a Uyghur girl who was pulled out of school by her parents and married off at the age of 15 to a 55-year-old wild imam to become his seventh wife. The husband would punch and kick her, not letting her go to hospital because it wasn't halal, would force her to cover her face and indoctrinated her with extremist 
ideology. And, and Jacqueline James comments, it would seem Aspie didn't want the Australian public to know the Chinese government helped rehabilitate this girl. Because unfortunately, the, the issue with the, there is a, the Uyghurs are Muslims, and there is a small element in their Uyghur population that have been radicalised and they're extremists and they've gone to fight in East, um, uh, Syria yeah. alongside ISIS, etc. Um, and they they recruit out of the poverty-stricken section mm. of the Uyghur population. There's, yeah, so Robbie, there's 15 million Uyghurs in approximately in uh, Western China, in, yeah. uh, in Xinjiang province. And yeah, um, you know, it's tragically, a, a some of them have been radicalised uh, into extreme... Uh, in you know Islamic State and so on went off to fight and there is this separatist movement in Western China that want to break off the entire Western half. Uh, the so Chinese government detected that they their fertile recruiting mm. ground was among um, was due to poverty, mm. right? And that's true everywhere. And so they they began their um, program. The fact is also in that same region of Xinjiang. All through the levels of the government, right up uh, through you know administrators uh, in the institutions, Uyghurs occupy positions within the government, uh, which is you know glossed over in uh, in these types of reports as well. So, so we can't do justice to Jack's report in um, in this show, but uh, read it yourself. We put out a press release about it yesterday. That's on our website. Um, it is worth if you if you have opinions on this subject, read this report because what it proves is that Aspie completely misrepresents things as evidence because, you know, it gets to get away with it because the, the evidence is all in Chinese, right? It completely misrepresents it. It twists evidence and it cherry picks evidence and it does so deliberately. It's deliberately presenting a distorted picture and it's this sort of thing that has fueled, I, I say it paves the way for war, Glenn. Mm, mm. We, we saw this, you know, every big war that we've, every big regime change war, like um, it, 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 it begins with demonising the target country, yeah. right? Everything they do is evil. Saddam was evil. You know, everyone, uh, Gaddafi was evil. They're all evil and we have to, we, we're justified in starting wars over that. There was, no, um, don't believe the lies. A very interesting report, um, uh, which we, hopefully we can uh, put up on screen, uh, where uh, a academic from the Soviet Union and the United States uh, wrote a, co-wrote a report um, at the height of the Cold War saying that if you want to... Uh, uh, if you want to uh, go to war, you have to demonise your enemy as being evil and not human. Yeah. And if you can create that propaganda in the mindset of your own people, yeah. um, that the other person is evil, then you can prevent any form of solution or peaceful solution. Um, so I also just want to say, Robbie, that, you know, commendation to, to Jack James on this because, uh, you know, when people in Australia do speak up and do dig yeah. into the hard evidence like this, um, groups like Aspie uh, preempt that, and they they play the man, not the ball, yep. uh, and character assassinate and do all those types of things because you know it's a we are in a McCarthyite type uh, era where if you you know we're getting to a point where you're not even allowed to talk diplomacy with China. There's no common ground, no common interest, and yeah, it's extremely dangerous when you silence those who are moderate or diplomatic in saying, look, there are ways we can move forward together. We can find a peaceful pathway if you're shutting them out and shutting out the people who look at the evidence like this. Um, then, yeah, it can only lead to war. Well, uh, Jack is independent and self-funded, and, and uh, it's her up against you know a big government-funded uh, think tank in that regard. Um, we've we've uh, been at this ourselves for a while, but we're a uh, we're a um, an established political party, but we've, t we've been taking us beyond for a while. We support this report and, and uh, 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 Jack's work in immensely. This, this is the sort of thing that has to be done to expose the lies. But because we absolutely know there to be them to be lies and we absolutely know ASPE is an organisation that exists to put at pedal these lies and the consequences is war, Australians need to take stock. Do we want war? Do we want war? And if the answer is yes, well, go watch another show. If the answer is no, join us in demanding Aspie must be shut down. It is intolerable and immoral that Australia pays for a think tank that does nothing but pump out lies to cause war. And on that note, Glenn, we better end the show. Thank oh. you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you.
and we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah. Uh, ho hopefully not too soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we're going to put him to work. I hope the viewers agree we should put him to work. Thanks to the viewers for tuning in to this week's uh, Citizens Report. Tune in next week for more. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.